Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be discussing how there is life in the blood. And I'm talking about the work being carried out by Christian friends of Magin David Adom in saving lives in Israel. Warm welcome to the programme. And I have two guests today, um, all the way from London. My first guest is uh, Barbara Dingle, um, who's here on behalf of Christian Friends of Mag and David Adom. So welcome back to the programme, Barbara. Thank you for having me, and thank you very much for your support for Mag and David Adom. It's a pleasure. I love doing this programme. And I'm also joined by uh, Dr Laura Richardson, who many of your, our viewers will, will know very well from the various programmes she does. So thank you very much for coming on the programme, because you were part of uh, the Revelation TV tour of Israel and Jordan and I don't know where we'd be without your help particularly looking after some of our, our, our sick viewers and looking after them so well so thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you to be here. Um, Laura, uh, sorry, Barbara, can you just describe a little bit about um, how you got involved with the work of Christian Friends of Mag and David Adom and, and the difference it's making to the Jewish community here but also in saving lives and we have to we have to really say that CF MDA is essentially Israel's ambulance service and Israel's main emergency service. That's right. Um, it's an interesting story. I work for a Jewish family office in central London and it must have been about, about 2006 when uh, Christian Friends of MDA was, was founded by a group of Christians in the north of England during the Second Lebanon War as a very practical way to support Israel at that time. Uh, the people I work for are very generous Jewish people and they were donating an ambulance at that time and I just thought this is amazing, people giving an ambulance to the State of Israel and there was a dedication service for it. Usually when there's a dedication people go to an MDA station but my guys are particularly busy so I was involved with the logistics of getting the ambulance to them which happened to be um, Hebrew University on Mount Scopus. So I had a lot of interaction with the then chief executive, um, a dear man, Ellie Benson, who sadly passed away recently. Um, I just thought, this is amazing. And then shortly afterwards, I was in Israel, and I ran into uh, Natalie Blackham, who you know, um, and she was working for CFMDA in Israel. And I said, oh, I'm involved in London. She said, we could do with some more support. Um, that's how I got involved. Fabulous. And. Um Laura, you've been very much involved in this channel for a long time, so it's great to have you on, on the program. But you have a, an incredible passion for Israel and a love for the Jewish people, and you know, I saw that on the tour at first hand. So share with us how the Lord's really placed a, a real love of Israel and the Jewish people upon your heart. Well, I think it started with my mother. I have to give her credit for this, really, because um, she went to Israel for the first time in 1994. And, and prior to that, she'd been, uh, she attended a, a college called Christian Life College, which was run by Elmer and Jean Darnell in, in London. And, and mum really developed a, a passion for Israel, partly through Christian Life College, but also going to Israel for the first time. And she came back and fed that to us children. And the, the funny thing was, it actually wasn't taught in our churches very much. I mean, I've been a Christian since 1984. Although I was a church goer and I grew up going to church, I became born again through my mother actually, and looking at the transformation in her life. So I, I don't actually remember any of the churches I attended talking about Israel and talking about the reason why God is the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Jacob and Israel or Jacob, and why it's important that if we don't recognize that God's actual word stands with Israel, that we're actually missing out a lot of the chunks of our Christian life. We're there to love Israel because our Messiah is Jewish, by the way, <laughs> and also many people who wrote the Bible were actually Jewish men as well. So I've been to Israel more times than I can think of now. And it's, uh, each time I go back, there's a different experience. This time we went to Rosh Hanikra, K-12, 
caves and that was fascinating. I've been going for quite a few years and never been there. So there's always so much to see. And I think as a Christian, we cannot avoid the issue of Israel. Absolutely. And um, Barbara, this is a special year for Christian friends of Mag and David Adom. Uh, and you've described it as being your Bar Mitzvah celebration That's year, right. which is your 13th anniversary. Um, can you share with us sort of the programme you have and how special this year is for Christian Friends of Mag and David Adom? Yes, uh, we look back on 13 years. Um, originally in 2006, we thought how wonderful it would be to raise enough money for one ambulance. And we just marvel at God's faithfulness because in those 13 years, due to the generosity of the Christian community in the UK and a lot of your, your viewers, Simon, We've actually given seven ambulances wow. to Israel, a blood mobile a vehicle for collect collecting the blood supplies, and an emergency room at Kiryat Shmona, right at the north. Um, and also now we're giving four medicycles. And all these vehicles and the emergency room, they all say donated by Christian friends in the UK. So we give all the glory to the Lord for the generosity um, of his people. And can you also, because it's very, very important that w when, when our viewers look at, say, Mag and David Adom and then compare it to our own ambulance service, our own ambulance service is provided by the NHS, which is provided by our tax, mm -hmm. by our taxes and therefore is government funded. But MDA is different, isn't it? Because there is no government funding whatsoever uh, in Israel's emergency service. Can you explain? Well, yes. Israel has to spend so much money on defence because as we know, it's always under attack. The Iron Dome is a wonderful invention, but that costs so much money. So therefore, MDA is supported by donations from around the world. And we just think it's wonderful that we Christians can join in with the Jewish diaspora in supporting MDA, the ambulance service, the blood collection service, and to actually be saving lives in Israel. So let's have a look now at uh, this wonderful promo, uh, which is exclusively shown here for the first time on uh, the Middle East Report. And uh, this is with my favourite ambassador, uh, Ron Prosser, and also the current ambassador, Mark Regev. I'm happy to support Christian Friends of MDA. This organisation is doing wonders to help Israel's emergency medical services, Magen David Adom. I've been following your work for years and have always been impressed with your commitment, passion and dedication. There's an old Jewish saying, he who saves one soul saves the entire world. Christian friends of MDA help save many, many lives every year. And by supporting this organization, it's as if you're doing it yourselves. Friends, MDA does crucial work. MDA does important work. MDA does life-saving work. I know this from first hand because my son for many years during his high school was an MDA volunteer manning their ambulances being part of their emergency services. And when people would ask my son, why are you giving of your free time to sit in ambulance? He would always say proudly because he is helping to save lives. And all of you who are part of MDA's important work can feel the same pride. You are being part of an important effort that is saving lives. So to each and every one of you who is part of Christian Friends of MDA, I say thank you for the important contribution you're making to save lives in Israel. Thank you. to Daraba. And it's great to see uh, two ambassadors there um, that were ambassadors to the UK, and Mark Regev still is, uh, endorsing the great work being done by Christian friends of Magin David Adon. Um, <coughs> Dr. Laura, I, I, I saw you in action on the tour when, when some of our uh, viewers fell, fell sick, and, uh, and we actually saw one of the uh, MDA ambulances turned up in the old city when one of our poor viewers got hit by one of the tractors that was driving through and hurt her arm. And I think uh, our own Leslie went to the uh, hospital, so she had her own personal experience of being in uh, an Israeli ambulance. Um, what is your experience uh, being a doctor with the work being done by uh, Mag and David Adon? Well, the first experience I had actually was back in 2006, I think, when it just mm -hmm. started out. Um, I was in Israel on tour 
and one of the fellow tourists um, hit the back of her head. She sat down on a bench and hit the back of her head. So she had a head injury and had to go to hospital. And because I was a doctor, I accompanied them in the ambulance to Hadassah Hospital. And I was so impressed. The, 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 first of all, the rapid response at which they got here. I mean, I work in the NHS and I know how, as you said, the taxpayers pay um, for the services of, of the national health and government has to allocate the services out. But a lot of MDA are, are members are actually volunteers. Yeah. These are people who do not get paid for what they're doing. The rapid response, the expertise, which of course you'd expect because they have to deal with not just head injuries but terrorist attacks, knife, car, car rammings, knife attacks, bombs and, and all sorts of things. But the, the expertise, the rapid response and also the youth actually, they were so young. And I, I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have something like that in the UK? But I was really impressed. And this time round, I went to the hospital again because one of our tour guy, uh, tour members was ill and had to stay back. And I visited a hospital called H Hasaf Harafe, which is very close to the, the airport. And again, I saw the way the, the MD, Mada, as we like to call them, came in with the, with the patients, young, Active. They had all the right mod cons, they had the communication skills. I was just absolutely excellent. I was so impressed. Now, I know they only take volunteers up to a certain age, and I'm wondering if they would make an exception for me, <laughs> slightly middle-aged woman, to come and do some voluntary work. I'd be so excited if I could do something like that. Excellent. I'm, I'm sure you get an opportunity. We have to speak to Daniel Berger, the CEO of uh, Mike and Davila Dom here in the UK. I'm sure he'll, he'll, I'm sure he'll make that possible for you, Laura. And um, Bob, Bob, when we're talking about the volunteers, and, and that's what's so incredible, I believe, about uh, uh, MADA or MDA, is the fact that there are so many volunteers. There is paid staff, and there's also an army of volunteers who who give up their own free time to be part of the ambulance crew. For some of the ambulance crew, uh, what is it like when they know that an ambulance has been donated, say, by the by uh, the incredible generosity of the supporters of Christian Friends of Magdalene David Adom, and know that there is so much Christian support for Israel and the Jewish people, particularly when they see an ambulance with, with your name on it. It's very special indeed. I've done a couple of shifts in ambulances in Israel, um, and there's a lot of waiting around because an ambulance will rush to get the patient, often takes them to the hospital, but then you have to wait. And this is a great opportunity to talk with the staff of the ambulance. And they often say, why are you doing this? You're a Christian. And it's a wonderful opportunity. I often say, it says in, in the New Testament, in Romans 15, that we have received spiritual blessings from the Jewish people, as Laura has said. They have given us everything we hold dear. And then it says that we should therefore give material blessings to Israel. So we're able to share these truths from the Bible. We're able to say to the Jewish people that they're not alone, that we stand with Israel. And of course we have good conversations with the Arabs who also are involved with MADA. Ab absolutely. So let's have a look now at uh, this uh, wonderful video which shows how so many different foreign volunteers come and donate their time and their summers to be part of the work of Magin David Adon. Hello, have I reached Magen David Adom? Magen David Daniel? Yes. Magen David Adom in Israel is the Israeli National Emergency Medical Services in charge of all the pre-hospital ambulance services, blood banking. We are training our own people and the Israeli public and we are also the Israeli National Red Cross Society. <laughs> One of the programs that we are promoting over the last 12 years is the Magenda Vida Dome Overseas Volunteers Program. This is a program that uh, brings young volunteers at the age of uh, 18 to 25, 27 to be trained in Magenda Vida Dome as first responders. We train from everything to amputations to Emergency birth, CPR, everything, IVs, which was fun. It's a, a wonderful program, Madakul, and I love coming back because I have lots of friends in the stations and it feels like every day when I go on a shift I make a difference in someone's life. It's just 
something you don't really get in the States. Amazing, incredible to see the amount of teamwork and preparation that they have. I mean, they have forms in every single ambulance just in case an Iran a mass casualty happens. So everyone knows what to do, who's in charge, and what's going on. I guess if you just hold someone's hand and the smile that you get, that's good for a lifetime. And uh, that gives you some insight into um, the volunteer program uh, that MDA have in uh, uh, accepting so many volunteers from all over the world to be part of MDA. Um, as, as a doctor, uh, and say, if, for example, we, we have, uh, hopefully we've got some young viewers watching that, that have a passion to be involved in, in the medical world, either want to be a doctor or want to be a nurse or want even want to be a paramedic. Um, if they volunteered as part of MDA, what do you think that would give them in terms of their career prospects um, and what kind of insight would they have being part of MDA in Israel? I think Israel is one of the top countries for uh, response to emergency situations, whether it's uh, terrorist attacks, uh, natural disasters, and you'll find that wherever there's a, a, a disaster, even in another part of the world, you'll find Israeli teams going there. So, you know, Ebola in Sierra Leone and the, the Thai cave um, boys, and, and wherever you find disaster, you'll find a team of highly trained people from Israel going to those places. And as Barbara said, Israel is constantly under attack. So they have to be highly, highly trained all the time. And even the young people who are going to the IDF get that training. And so they are so qualified to help other people around the world. I'll give you an example. I went to Israel about two, three years ago and it was Jerusalem day. And the streets were absolutely packed with people. Everybody was heading towards the Tower of David and just mulling around on Jaffa Street. And it got to a crisis point where there were so many people on the tram lines, on the street, that the trams couldn't get through. So there was a standstill, and they were just basically, were just sandwiched between two trams and, pass, and, and people on, on the pedestrian, um, on the side of the, of the trams. It could have been a panic situation, but it was so well controlled. We got a couple of IDF soldiers who said, everybody just stop, stand still, everybody obeyed them, and the panic was over. They let the trams through, and we continued on our journey. That's because even at the age of 18, 19, 20, young Israelis are trained in the IDF. So if we could have people from Israel actually going to other countries, because we are living, unfortunately, in a day of terrorist attacks now. We're living in a day where having an emergency is not, uh, it's not a rarity. It's almost commonplace. You know, we, we, we had the Manchester uh, situation in, in, and then the London uh, terrorist attacks as well. So I think we could gain a lot from having them come to show us how to do this. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. And um, Barbara, if there are viewers, and I hope there are, uh, watching today's programme that have been very inspired by this programme and would like to volunteer and to become a medic um, for MDA, how can they do that? Well, the best thing is to contact the MDA office. But um, another suggestion as a, as a start is if people are going to Israel with a group, a church group or on one of the tours, again, do get in touch with the MDA office because we can put on sessions for people to be trained in first aid. I've done oh, no. it myself. I've gone to the MDA station in Jerusalem um, with Christine Darg's group and we've all had a lesson in CUPR. Um, 
Excellent. So that's a great that's a great start. Uh, uh, and one thing that Israel is developing, particularly um, MDA, is their national blood bank that is being um, built underground. Uh, uh, cost of I don't know. Eighty million pounds. Eighty million. Eighty million pounds. That's an awful lot of money. So can you explain to us why this new blood centre has to be built underground and and why the blood in Israel is so important? Of course. Um, Israel always has to be ahead of the game and the old facility uh, needs to be updated. So this new facility in Halon, in the, um, in the center of Israel, um, will be five stories. Some of it will be underground because it needs to be protected against biological chemical attack. That's always a possibility. Also cyber attack. So much of our lives today are, are cyber related and that's always a possible threat. Also natural disasters, we know Israel is in an earthquake region. So for many reasons, this new facility will be better protected than the old one. And like all countries, but especially in Israel, blood supplies are always required. Some of the blood products, there are about five products, the Laurel will know better than I do on this, but the red blood cells, the white blood cells, plasma, some of it only has a very short shelf life of three or four days. So there's a constant need to be blood ready. And this new facility uh, will be specialist in this. So let's have a look now at uh, Israel's new underground blood center. It's been called the most precious liquid on earth. And even in a Middle Eastern country like Israel, it's more precious than oil or water. It's blood, the fluid that makes life possible, delivering oxygen and nutrients to the body, fighting infection, and launching the process of healing. And thanks to blood transfusions, it's now one of the biggest factors in people surviving once fatal injuries. So few things are as important to a nation's health as blood for medical emergencies whether they're caused by everyday accidents or the acts of war and terrorism that Israelis face. Israel's blood supply is collected, safety tested, and distributed by Magen David Adom, which also serves as the country's ambulance service. Today, Magen David Adom supplies 97% of Israel's civilian blood and all the blood for the Israel Defense Forces. Magen David Adom's current blood center was built in 1987 when Israel needed to collect 175,000 units of blood to meet the needs of 4.4 million people. Just a few years later, however, the world order changed, reshaping the face of Israel. The Iron Curtain that prevented Jews from leaving the Soviet Union fell, enabling more than a million Russians to come to Israel, swelling the nation's population and stretching medical resources, including the blood supply. Today, Israel's population has surpassed 8.5 million people, and MDA needs to collect nearly 400,000 units of blood to meet demand, more than twice what it needed when the blood center was first built. By 2030, Israel's population is expected to reach 10 million, which will require more than half a million blood units. Israel needs a larger blood center and a larger facility to house Magen David Adom's growing cord blood program where stem cells are stored for cutting edge medical treatments around the world. But building a bigger blood center doesn't by itself address Israel's needs. And that became abundantly clear in November 2012. Israel's most belligerent enemies, Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in the Gaza Strip, previously didn't have rockets sophisticated enough to reach Magen David Adom's blood center near Tel Aviv. But the Gaza rocket crisis of 2012 and the second war with Hamas in 2014 were game changers. Now Israel's enemies, both to the north and south, can hit any part of Israel, leaving millions of Israelis and the blood supply vulnerable. That's why Magen David Adom's new Marcus Blood Center will not only have a larger processing capacity, it will be secure from attack, reinforced with its most crucial services, such as blood processing and storage, underground and out of harm's way. This will ensure that Israeli civilians and soldiers have blood when they need it most, and it will enable the blood center to continue to operate in the midst of a crisis to meet the needs of the country and ensure the survival of Israelis. 
To make this new blood center a reality, it's up to us, all of us. Together, we need to make it happen because eight and a half million Israelis are counting on us. As you can see there that uh, Israel's uh, national blood centre is so important for the future survival of the state. Uh, and Laura, when we look at Israel's security situation, up in Hezbollah there's something like 160 to 180,000 rockets and missiles that are targeting every Israeli city and town. Um, if we look at the situation in Syria, we have 80,000 troops and militias under Iran's control, only 50 miles from Israel's border. We look at the situation in Gaza, which um, Hamas could fire and launch its rockets and missiles into Israel at any time. And then you have the instability of the Palestinian Authority that, that could um, launch attacks against Israel. So not also not discussing the Iranian threat, nuclear threat uh, as well. So what Israel has to face is pretty much unprecedented uh, in comparison to any other Western nation. Um, is that what makes Israel so incredible, that they can see the threats coming and they prepare for them in advance? So building this new blood center and having their blood bank underground to protect that vital supply of blood needed in case any emergencies, what does that say about the Israelis to you? Well, first of all, it tells me that there is a God, the God of Israel, who gives them the wisdom, the ingenuity, the ability to put this all together. God, and God doesn't lie, he keeps his word. So that's the first thing, that's what gives me hope for my personal life, that God keeps his word. So Israel has been shown over and over again to have the skills, the ingenuity, the new, the lots of startups that are, that are coming up because people are coming up with these witty ideas. It gives me the confidence to know that God is in control and God will keep his word. But also I think I would love people to be humble and to say this nation has been under attack as you've mentioned the statistics from, and they're still standing. So let's learn from them. Let's find out how they do things. Um, a lot of us in the Western world live in a sort of a la-la, cosy, unrealistic um, ideology that terrorism is only a thing that happens elsewhere. But we are beginning to see France, even in the UK, that terrorism is on our doorstep. And it actually gives a, a kind of a double meaning to Psalm 91 when he talks about you will not be afraid of the terror by day, by night. We are in a, we're in a world where terrorism is actually a daily occurrence. And I think we would learn a lot, medical services in, in the NHS, by actually going to Israel and saying, how do you do this? How do you preempt? Because it's not just about reacting. Absolutely. Unfortunately, a lot of us react to situations. We only react when something's happened. We need to get a state where we're actually preempting what the enemy will or could do and actually saying we're going to build services and we're going to protect ourselves to preempt what they're about to do. Uh, uh, and Barbara, we, we're very proud of our, of our NHS in this country. We're very proud of our doctors like uh, Laura and uh, our nurses and uh, paramedics that do a tremendous job in saving lives uh, on a daily basis in this country. But what do you think our own medical services can learn from Israel's experience, so particularly now that in recent years that, that uh, Britain's faced um, its own terror attacks, uh, for example, the, the Westminster Bridge attack and then followed by the London Bridge attack um, and also the horrendous suicide bombing that we saw mm -hmm. at Manchester Arena to deal with a kind of mass casualty terror attack. What do you think that our own medical services can learn from Israel's experiences? Okay. Well, first of all, living in the UK, I'm very grateful for the National Health Service. I'm grateful to God that uh, we are safe here, that we can be, be treated. Um, but I think we can also learn a lot from Israel. Um, it's always a case of preparedness, trying to be one step ahead of the enemy, of the terrorists. And um, I know in the UK, we are, we are blessed by cooperation with Israel intelligence, that helps keep us safe on the streets in the UK.
absolutely. And, and, and Laura, on this, this very subject, um, I don't know if there are schemes, but I'm sure there are schemes where um, Israeli doctors uh, go over to, to this country and advise and share their experiences in dealing with kind of terrorism and dealing with a kind of multiple terrorist attacks um, and preparing medical staff and doctors for this eventuality. I mean, the threat here is not so grave as it is in Israel, but it seems that Israel is really dealing with the terrorism threat. I mean, there hasn't been a suicide bombing now in Israel for a couple of years. Israel's security fence has prevented almost 100% suicide bombings in Israel. What Israel has to contend now with is these horrendous rockets that, that come over. But thanks to Israel's um, technology. Uh, so many Israelis are protected by uh, Israel's missile defense system known as the Iron Dome. But, but what, think, what lessons could Israeli paramedics, doctors and nurses teach um, our doctors and nurses in terms of dealing with these situations? First of all, I mean, I think the, the NHS does train staff very well. I mean, paramedics and all the 999 services are very, very well trained. But I think, again, it's the thing about, yes, we know how to deal with road traffic, road traffic accidents, heart attacks, you know, people jumping off and breaking bones and that sort of thing. But I think the element of terrorism is probably not as well prepared in the UK. And I would like to see people like Jeremy Hunt, who's currently the health secretary, actually liaise. Foreign secretary, sorry. Sorry, I've got the wrong. Foreign secretary. That's <laughs> oh, a foreign secretary now. He used to be um, yes, he did. Health, health secretary, oh dear. Um, but people, whoever the health, who's the health secretary now? I can't. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, whoever the health secretary is, to actually use, because we pay tax, we, we are taxpayers and we pay our taxes to the government to keep the NHS England going. I would like to see them actually, as Barbara says, liaising with people in Israel and saying, how do you do this and how do you do it well? But on a personal level, I am I'm actually a supporter of uh, CFMDA and I would like to encourage people, whether you're a medic or not, to actually support them because you can see the fruit and we actually don't know when we're going to need, we travel to Israel all the time, you don't know when you're going to need a blood transfusion or help from the MDA and as we see they're always there, always, always there. So, and, and I'd also like to see more volunteers in the NHS. I mean, the, the um, MADAT is run a lot by volunteers. I'd like to see people who are unemployed, who may be waiting for jobs, actually be trained up to help the emergency services in the UK. And they can learn a lot from Israel about how to absolutely, do this. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and Barbara, I just want to share about the, the, the cultural diversity of MDA in Israel and the fact that you know, we have a real example of um, uh, Jews and Arabs uh, working together on shifts and ambulance shifts. Um, what does that say about the organisation that doesn't discriminate against uh, Jews or Arabs and has many Jews and Arabs actually working in, uh, in Mag and David Adon? Well, of course, it's a wonderful example, maybe one of the prime examples of the argument against apartheid. Um, on any given ambulance, you'll, you might have an Israeli Arab, you might have a, a religious Jewish person, you might have a secular Jew, you might have someone from one of the other minorities, the Druze or perhaps the Bedouins. And, you know, if somebody has had a heart attack, a Jewish person, say, has had a heart attack, an ambulance turns up and it's an Arab paramedic, who cares? They're just really grateful to have a medical professional to treat them. So MDA helps break down barriers. Excellent. Um, let's have a look at uh, this uh, uh, excellent video and uh, this is a volunteer volunteering in Jerusalem with uh, MDA. My name is uh, Hagai. I'm living in uh, Kirat Arba. I'm a paramedic here in Jerusalem. I started volunteering when I was uh, 15 years old. When we arrived to the shift, we start uh, to check the ambulance to see that everything that we need is there. And we check the mechanical of the, the car.
where they have a gentleman, I think a gentleman, who they suspect is going through a heart attack. In the last uh, uh, six months, the badly most of the, the terror attacks was in my uh, in my uh, city uh, in Kiryat Arba, Hebron. So it's not r it's not easy the, uh, to arrive to a scene and uh, to di to discover that you are treating friends or uh, people that you know and. Was that you need to treat a very, very uh, bad injured soldiers. Five, six years ago, I uh, delivered twins in uh, an ambulance. I just remember and uh, and every time is like we have a battery that feeling that feels back. When you go to Elman, and uh, even if you only need uh, help to go from the floor to the bed, it's a good feeling that someone is smiling to you when you finish your treatment and say thank you. And that gives us a little bit of an insight into what it must be like uh, being an ambulance driver uh, in Israel, uh, serving with uh, MDA. Um, Laura, I have to ask you, what support is given to uh, Israeli paramedics, particularly dealing with the trauma of a terror attack, um, as we see kind of uh, on a kind of regular basis, but thankfully not so regular now, uh, in Jerusalem or in Tel Aviv or somewhere in Israel? Um, how does it how do, uh, do you think israel deals with the psychological impact of seeing um such an attack and and how do they prepare their paramedics can to deal with that psychologically i think it's very difficult um because the confrontation of blood and you know limbs and people dying and you not being able to save somebody at the roadside it, it can be and it is very devastating but i think one of the things about going to that sort of service is that people are screened at the beginning psychologically to make sure that they can withstand the trauma but also that they've got coping mechanisms in place and that they have a good service for psychologically and you, and you will see this over and over again when you have a report of disaster there will always be counseling services to support the victims but also the people who are involved in first response and I think a lot of people who go into first response have the personality to deal with that they have a lot of adrenaline <laughs> I mean there's some people who will deal very very rapidly because they're, they're, they're basically programmed that way. I think it's very important that people do use the services that are provided. They do have counselling services to deal with the after effects, post-traumatic stress disorder and the like. Um, personally, I see a lot of uh, 999 uh, people who've had to retire from the services because they can't take the ongoing psychological trauma of dealing with disaster over and over again. But hopefully, and I, and I believe in Israel, it's a much more cast iron process where they provide services for people. Excellent. Uh, and Barbara, back in uh, 2014, after um, Israel's uh, defensive war against uh, Hamas, um, in Gaza, which Hamas were firing um, rockets and missiles into Israel, which paralyzed two thirds of Israel's population. And uh, also, we see that uh, Hamas were responsible for the murder of three uh, Orthodox teenagers as well, um, which, which 
resulted in Israel having no other choice but to send ground troops into Gaza. And it was in the aftermath of that that I interviewed um, one of Israel's paramedics who was over here in this country talking about the great work being carried out by MDA. And what she said that is that she had to deal with um, a, a, a terrorist who's been responsible for a terror attack. Now, isn't this extraordinary that yeah, there are people, sadly, um, uh, Islamic terrorists who are determined to as kill as many Jewish and Israeli lives as possible, and yet we see Jewish MDA medics helping them uh, and uh, not discriminating against them. Um, what does that say about Israel's medical service? I think it says about Israel and about really Judaism, the sanctity of human life is so important that every life counts. We know as Christians, all lives count to God. And this is part of the work of matter. They will turn up and whoever needs the treatment first, whoever's the most seriously wounded, whether that's the terrorist or the person that they're trying to attack, it is done in a sort of triage order. So um, we, we praise Israel for the sanctity of human life. And. Uh Laura, one issue that uh, Israel's been dealing with in recent years is knife attacks. We've also seen a large number of disturbing knife attacks in, uh, in this country as well, particularly in our capital in London. Um, from Israel's experience, how does a paramedic deal with, with such an attack? Well, with, with first of all, they are trained in CPR. So if a patient is bleeding, they go through the ABC, airways, breathing, circulation, stop the breathing, make sure they are um, alert. And if they're not, they get the bleeding stopped and then they get carried into hospital. They might need to have an IV drip on the way as well. So they are trained. We are, those who would respond are fully trained in what they're doing. But I think it's also important to deal with prevention as well. And I think one of the things that I found in Israel, especially when you go in shopping malls, is they have places where security, where they will check your bags. Um, and I think that actually is something that needs to be established in lots of um, public places, even in this country where people are stopped and searched or where you have to pass through a metal detector. I mean, if you go to anywhere in Israel, in Mamila Mall, whatever, you'll find metal detectors where you will be stopped, your bag will be looked through before you enter. I think prevention is important. But I have absolute confidence in, in the first response. I've seen it firsthand that they respond brilliantly. So with a knife attack, the main, the main problem really is bleeding. And the other problem is obviously where the knife has gone into. If it's punctured a lung, the lung might collapse. And um, you know, if it's punctured the heart, of course, there'll be a lot of bleeding. But they know what to do. They know how to stop the bleeding where it's necessary. And the important thing is to get the patient to hospital as soon as possible. You will find that sometimes they spend a lot of time on the ground actually stabilizing a patient and you might see scenes where where they do that and that's also important to do because there's no point just rushing a patient to the hospital if they're stabilized then in a better condition to be treated when they go and this is where when you see a mag and david ambulance it's kitted with all the things necessary it's almost like a mini hospital actually it's kitted with all the things that are necessary to save a life is pos if possible to maintain that life and then to get further help so um i would so love to be a volunteer Simon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and barbara the uh, mda paramedics um are very motivated we, we saw uh, a couple of clips uh, on this program so far and they have an absolute dedication to try and save lives and that's what motivates them so is that their reward to actually save a life if they can and this is what allows them to cope with everything they see and everything they have to deal with absolutely um, every life is special every life is worth saving and um, a very nice story last week I got an email to say that one of our Christian friends of MDA ambulances um, had delivered a little baby boy. Oh. So sometimes there are nice stories like that as well. Excellent. So if you've ever wondered what it's like to be um, on an ambulance shift with uh, MDA, you can now. Hello everybody, today I'm doing a shift as a volunteer EMT on the, um, the Magin David Adama Ambulance, uh, on the Natana Ambulance. And um, so I thought I'd show you around the ambulance. 
Okay, so this is the inside of the ambulance. You see over here we have all kinds of medications and gloves, different equipment. This is the thing that they used to restart people's hearts. And that's the bed. Um, this is a special ambulance that's called a Natan, which has extra like equipment and things. So it's it's like the ICU ambulance and it has extra medications and it generally I think there's what there's one on, on call for the whole night basically in central Jerusalem that's us so <laughs> gotta do our jobs right, that's right. Yeah. oh and I'm the perfect type you see this this is the perfect type for uh, for being a volunteer in the ambulance Along this side we have all the oxygen tanks, the uh, oxygen masks. Over here we have um, neck braces. That's the mini oxygen tank that, that we take uh, with us into a person's house or wherever the call happens. This is like the basic kit that we take um, also out of the ambulance. Over here we have medication. This is for uh, children for um, helping them breathe and stuff. Here we have extra oxygen masks, not uh, oxygen tanks, well I keep mixing them up. This is the big one that always stays in that ambulance. And this is something that's like pretty new to me because they didn't used to have it on the ambulances. It's a machine that does like uh, heart compressions for you, which is pretty cool. Okay, I'm gonna show them outside. This is what the ambulance looks like from outside. And right now we're in Sharitza the hospital. We're just waiting outside because we just brought somebody to the hospital. That's that's my ride for the evening. Pretty cool, no? So it started to get light out, which means that my shift is almost over. And it was a really interesting one. I had a patient with BT and I uh, hung out with some friends that I hadn't seen for a while. and. I really, really enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting as well. Um, I guess the one other thing I would say is that this semester it's, it just works out that I'm going to be uploading on Thursdays instead of Mondays. So if you want to see more videos... Really good uh, vlog there of uh, a volunteer volunteering with MDA and now we know what an inside of an Israeli ambulance looks like. Uh, Laura, you had to be impressed, didn't you? Absolutely amazing. Uh, I, and can you, a technical question for you, um, can you compare the difference between, uh, say, a British ambulance and an Israeli ambulance in terms of the equipment and, and, and what have you? Well, I was, I was fascinated by that vlog. I mean, it's, it beats casualty and all these unreal programs where people get a false idea of what it's actually like to work in the 999 service. That was a, I mean, that was a super kitted um, ambulance truck. That was super, super kitted. As I said, that's like a walking hospital. She said it was an IC unit. The NHS ambulances are, are pretty good. I mean, the last time I was in one was probably about two, two weeks ago when I had to admit a, uh, a, a little child. And so the ambulance came to the doctor's surgery and mother and baby went out and I sort of had to pop my head in to, have a, to hand over papers and things to the child. The, the NHS ambulance are pretty well kitted, but I have to say, the thing about it, and I, I wouldn't say it's, it, it negatively compares, but I have to say that when it comes to the speed of response, Mada responses are so, so much more quickly. And you hear people saying, we're waiting a long time for an ambulance, waiting 20, 30 minutes, or what have you. So the equipments are pretty good um, in the NHS as well, and they make sure they keep that standard. But there are not as many ambulances, I have to say, in the NHS. Um, I think, again, perhaps going slightly political, we need a little bit more funds for the NHS to make sure that the ambulances are improved. We have breakdown of ambulances. And so you have to have lots of ambulances in reserve. And this is something that really, I think, would be good for the, the government to address. To address. If I was health secretary, um, <laughs> this is something that I would really seriously like to address. But that was a fantastic, really fully equipped uh, an ambulance. I haven't seen one like that in, in ages. Excellent. And um, 
Barbara, you've, uh, you, you and your organisation have, have provided so many ambulances for as well. It's extraordinary. Um, can you break down the actual cost of an ambulance? So the ambulance we just saw, saw there on that excellent vlog, how much would you say that would cost? Well, a, first of all, a standard ambulance, a white one, costs just over £60,000. And the yellow ones, the MIKUs, Mobile Intensive Care Unit, is about 80, 85. But of course, that's just the ambulance. And um, it has to be fully equipped, which is, depending on what's in it, quite a lot more. But what we like to do in Christian Friends of MDA, we believe in the principle of tithing. So we'd like to give another 10%. It's not exactly tithing, but we, we do. We give another 10% to enable these ambulances to be equipped. Because it's no good just having an empty ambulance. Absolutely. And, um, Laura, I think you've been inspired by this programme um, and by the work of Christian Friends of Mag and David Adon. In your opinion, why is it so important to support the work of CFMDA? Life. Choose life. Um, life is precious. God has created all of us for a purpose and a plan. And it's a privilege to have, to be a part of CMFMDA, uh, which I have been for eight, nine years, Life is precious. Those who value life will value the work the Christian Friends of Maggie Dabner do and also the work of Mada. And I would encourage anybody who could spare whatever amount of income they have to support um, MDA. And um, Barbara, how can our viewers, uh, maybe if, if you're a nurse or a doctor or a paramedic uh, and you do tremendous work but have a heart and a passion for Israel and the Jewish people, uh, get involved with the work of Christian Friends of Mag and David Adon? Well, first of all, do contact us via the website. Um, anyone can get involved though, not just people in the medical profession. So um, I know a lot of your viewers are in Israel prayer groups. So do pray for the work of MDA, that lives would be saved. Um, if anyone is in a church or fellowship and they would like a speaker, we've got an executive team that's around the country, literally. We've got Jean Brannigan in Scotland, down to Alan and Jane Ferguson in Jersey, and people in between. And um, if anyone feels led to perhaps Christmas is on the horizon um, in a few months' time, if anyone perhaps wants to take up a collection for their Christmas offering, um, MDA's a very good cause. And um, down to the final minutes of the programme, uh, Laura, I what, what makes MDA probably so unique is it's not political, is it? I mean, you can, this is a way of supporting Israel, um, supporting lives, both Jewish, Jews and Israel, uh, sorry, Jews and Arabs living in Israel um, without there being any kind of political bias involved at all. It's wonderful um, and it shows a sense of the love for the country, whether you're an Arab Jew or Ethiopian Jew or an Israeli Jew, everyone is involved because they love the country. They love life, they love their country and they want people to live and not die. Uh, Dr. Laura and also Barbara, thank you so much for being my thank guest you. on today's Middle East Report to discuss the incredible work being carried out by Christian friends of Mag and David Adon. Um, I just want to thank you uh, for watching this programme and uh, you know, oh, my heart goes out to the incredible work being carried out by Christian friends of Mag and David Adon in saving lives in Israel. And this is Israel's national emergency service. This is Israel's ambulance service and they do a tremendous job. Many of them are volunteers, many of them don't get paid Paid. And without uh, this support from around the world, um, Israel would have no emergency service. So please keep them in prayer. Please support them. And we leave you with this song in dedication to the work being done by Christian friends of Mag and David Adon.